uh, welcome you all, uh, of course, to this uh, webinar. And I hope that you can also hear me uh, clearly. Uh, okay, so so perhaps we can get started because we have uh, quite an important topic, of course, uh, that we're covering today and and uh, a rich um, um, uh, um, discussion, uh, I hope, that will ensue after the presentation by the panelists. Um, again, welcoming you all and thanking you all for joining us today uh, for this uh, important IC briefing, another important IC briefing on adapting COVID-19 preparedness and response in low capacity and humanitarian settings. So, uh, colleagues, we're all... If I may ask colleagues that are online to please uh, mute their phones or their computers, that would be great just to minimize the background noise. Thank you. Uh, so colleagues, we're all uh, aware of the uh, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and what it has had uh, in terms of impact on individuals and communities globally. Uh, this impact uh, is further compounded and exacerbated on vulnerable communities in fragile uh, context and humanitarian uh, settings, particularly in densely populated areas such as IDP camps, refugee camps, as, as well as informal settlements and slums in urban settings, where prevention and control measures such as tracing, testing, isolating, and care for all COVID cases and patients is, uh, is extremely uh, challenging. Uh, furthermore, the prevention and control measures that have featured quite prominently in the response in high resource settings, including in Western contexts, such as lockdowns and implementing critical hygiene measures and social distancing, are not only more challenging um, to implement in these contexts, but they also place additional risks and exacerbate the vulnerabilities of the populations in many of the contexts, uh, humanitarian settings that we uh, are operating in. It is against this backdrop that the Interagency Standing Committee has recognized and underlined the importance of adapting the humanitarian response to prevent, number one first, is to prevent and minimize the risks of uh, the spread of the virus while also caring for individuals that are contracting it. And secondly, and equally as importantly, is to ensure that uh, critical life-saving humanitarian assistance and protection continues. So in May this year, the IAC developed um, the interim guidance on public health and social measures for COVID-19 preparedness and response operations in low capacity and humanitarian settings. This has been a joint endeavor by a number of IAC members and in consultation with the IAC uh, member organizations and the larger humanitarian community to make sure that critical and timely guidance on how to prepare for and respond in the current COVID environment is made available to uh, frontline responders so that they can adapt uh, their approach to delivering uh, this critical life-saving humanitarian assistance uh, on the ground. Now, the purpose of today's uh, webinar is really to hear firsthand from colleagues on the ground um, uh, with regards to these challenges that are being faced in responding in low capacity and humanitarian settings and equally is also to get a clear picture with regards to the applicability and usefulness of the guidance that has been developed by the ISC and also an opportunity to really capture lessons learned and best practices that can better inform uh, uh, additional guidance or tools that the field may require or need and also inform ongoing response efforts. Uh, we have an excellent uh, panel uh, today and I'm extremely, extremely um, honored, honored that we are joined by um, um, some brilliant uh, colleagues that are leading critical aspects of the response uh, on the ground, um, including Dr. Hur Salman Amir, who is one of the founders of Dari, which is an Iraqi NGO, and he currently serves as its head of the medical committee. Uh, Dr. Amir holds a medical degree and has worked in the humanitarian sector since 2012. In his previous roles, uh, Dr. Amir led vaccination campaigns in displacement sites and primary health care centers, and he represents Dari in various humanitarian coordination bodies, including the health and protection clusters. I'm e equally honored and uh, privileged and happy that uh, Ms. Khardiata uh, uh, Ndaye, who is currently the RCHC uh, AI in Niger and who also served as RC 
and UNDP's resident representative in Niger between 2007 and 2011 that you were able to join us today, uh, Dr. Khadiata. Thank you so much again. Uh, she's previously served as Director General of the World Bank Funded Social Development Fund Agency and also as advisor to the Minister of for Planning in the Ministry of Economy, Finance and Planning in Senegal. Uh, welcome again, Dr. Ndaye. Um, I'm Ahlan, hello. Hello, Dr. Hello, Dr. Khadiata. Uh, I'm also happy uh, to um, and uh, to and pleased to be joined today with uh, by uh, Mr. Zakayo Kalebo, who is the team leader for the Kigomo Refugee uh, Program uh, with World Vision in Tanzania. Uh, Mr. Kalebo has more than 15 years of experience in the humanitarian sector, having worked on camp management, gender-based violence, child protection, and social services, among others. In his current role, uh, Mr. Kalebo leads efforts to provide food and nutrition assistance to approximately 135,000 refugees as part of the Kigoma refugee uh, program. Last but definitely uh, not least, uh, it was also important to make sure that we capture um, the global uh, perspective. So I'm extremely happy again that we were joined by Dr. Rene Van de Wert who currently serves as Director AI of Health Emergency Interventions and is also Chief of the Fragile Conflict and Vulnerable Settings Unit with the World Health Organization in Geneva. Uh, um, uh, Renee started her career as Medical Coordinator for MSF Belgium in various countries, including DRC, Sierra Leone, Chad, Rwanda, and Chechia. She also carried out critical work with UNICEF, including as Chief of Health and Nutrition in Chad, and Chief of Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health with UNICEF in New York. Welcome, Renee, and welcome to all of our panelists. Um, thank you for joining uh, today, and I very much hope that you can hear me uh, uh, loud and, and clear. Um, now, as with usual practice, we're going to kickstart, of course, uh, by hearing first from our panelists, and then we will open the floor for uh, questions and comments. Uh, we will be using the chat box to capture uh, your questions and comments, and I'll have the opportunity to direct these questions and comments to our panelists. So please um, uh, use the chat box um, uh, to flag uh, any comments or questions that you may have. Um, and without further ado, let's get started. Um, I'm starting first with Dr. Hur Salman Amr with Dari in Iraq. So uh, uh, Dr. Amr, uh, addressing the direct and indirect consequences of COVID-19 through public health and social measures has been a priority for the Interagency Standing Committee and the recently developed guidance on resp responding in low resource settings aimed at providing practical and timely guidance to frontline responders. Um, it would be great to hear from you, Dr. Amir, uh, Amir if you could please uh, perhaps shed light on how public health requirements around screening, testing, and tracing were adapted to the response uh, in Iraq. Uh, specifically, it would be uh, uh, extremely helpful if you could uh, uh, shed light on uh, some of the challenges faced and the good practices um, uh, in, um, uh, faced in Iraq, including how you worked and collaborated with other local frontline responders and the health cluster to isolate, track, and care for COVID-19 patients. Uh, particularly in camps. So perhaps with that, Dr. Aymer, over to you, um, and we look forward to your interventions. Dr. Uh, thank Aymer? you very much. Yes, yes, I hear you. I, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, hello. Um, thanks. Thank you very much for your intro introductions. Thank you. Uh, actually, um, I will start from uh, uh, introductions. As you mentioned, I am Dr. Hur Salman from the Human Organization, this local NGO, and uh, we are uh, we have we have the substantial reach and access in Iraq and Kurdistan. Uh, we were tasked on behalf on Iraq to provide a presentation on the current activities that we are providing, as well as the COVID-19 situation and how it's affected our activities, plus the manner um, in which we are able to cope with the COVID-19 issues. So, based on that, uh, what, what my, my first slides, uh, I, will, I will talk about the, uh, uh, the challenges, actually. Uh, uh, first, first challenges, 
uh, that there is uh, uh, actually uh, uh, access issue in Iraq. These have been ongoing for about several years due to, due to security mm -hmm. reasons and due to difficulties uh, in getting access letters. And this was actually affecting uh, these services delivery because of the affecting the transportation of supplies on the staff within the governorate and out of the governorate. So, and, uh, and, this, uh, and these things have been increased actually. So, uh, this has been further affected by COVID-19 movement restrictions. So, we already have movement restrictions. They will even mm -hmm. for the affected by COVID. The second things, uh, the second things we have, DOH staff were not paid salaries for months. That's um, that's demoted <coughs> them. So also reflected on the on the um, uh, providing uh, for these services. So this is there are also uh, another challenges. But this, uh, what I mentioned, uh, this is the most important one. So uh, therefore, we are we are getting to the coping strategies. Uh, as we are uh, uh, as we are partner of uh, uh, in, uh, health cluster in Iraq, so we are using uh, coordination and uh, reporting uh, with the access working group on incidents and uh, hastening access letters for transports of supplies and the staffs to facilitate their reach to the uh, to our activities. Uh, the second uh, important things is coordination and, uh, uh, and maintaining relationship with the local health authorities, um, Ministry of, of Health, and uh, Directorate of Health. So to 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 obtain the staff that reach to the primary health care facilities, especially inside the camps, and uh, for uh, ambulance uh, support and referral of these severe cases. Uh, we are uh, we are uh, as uh, um, as uh, a partner. We we also coordinate with the subnational and national health cluster, who are the main guide for all the activities and uh, following of the gaps needs, especially uh, and other um, uh, points. With also with camp management and other partner working in the camps to ensure the smooth uh, service provision and to complement the the need and uh, to, to identify the gaps and try, try to uh, solve it. Uh, as a part of the coordination, we are also uh, uh, fo following the uh, retrainees working group on families leaving the camps and the uh, diary uh, uh, team supervises the, and monitor the retrain of these such families to their area of origin and to uh, know if there is a new displacement or uh, a retrainees a retrainee uh, movement outside the camp to their areas uh, and as part of coordination also with the health authorities in retrain area to follow up on those families who arrived uh, to their um, uh, origin uh, area of origin to know uh, the real situation and uh, to know to to know what is the uh, what what is their situation in in, in uh, beside the COVID uh, situation. So uh, this is the uh, uh, coping mechanisms, and uh, uh, I will come to uh, I will come to a second slide, please. I will come to service provision during COVID nineteen. We are we are uh, going through uh, many steps to ensure that those uh, that those uh, uh, standards uh, as a part of WHO standards, for example, uh, starting from temperature checking in the entrance of health facilities, to uh, know the uh, main symptoms of the suspected cases, to take uh, care of these points. Also ensuring the physical distancing. Uh, inside the primary health care facilities and waiting areas. Also, we have uh, uh, advising the beneficiaries to wear masks and to use hand sanitizing before they enter the PHC. It's very important to uh, give them um, a chance to use these mechanisms, in, not just in health facilities, uh, also in their uh, uh, daily uh, uh, working activities and also in their homes. 
Uh, also, part of this uh, uh, service provision, we are using infection prevention control uh, control training for DPHC staff, and uh, this enhances uh, how uh, they can uh, control and uh, uh, prevent the spread of this infection. Also, conducting of COVID-19 health awareness and promotions activities uh, on uh, static and mobile clinics. Uh, and inside the camps uh, and outside as well in the host community. So we have uh, to remind our uh, beneficiaries about uh, three W's, which is wear your mask and, uh, uh, and wash your hands and properly and watch your distance to leave at least one meter between uh, each one uh, to ensure physical spacing and distancing. So and uh, uh, and concentrate on the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 and mode of trans transmission, uh, and also a uh, regular disinfection of all services, hand door, and each handles, uh, 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 tables, chairs where they are sitting, and uh, all uh, touchable uh, materials in the health facilities. And in coordination with the WHO E1 team, we are doing multiple uh, training conducting to the health facilities staff. So those uh, staffs can uh, uh, identify the cases through case definition and uh, recognize at least the most suspected cases and then report it uh, through immediate report of E1 system, early warning system. And, uh, and the case definition and uh, uh, also uh, in connection with the directorate of health and who are authorized uh, to uh, know this information. And uh, the third slide, I will talk about uh, the feedback on the IAC uh, SC guidance. You, you already shared with us the interim um, uh, guidance. And actually, the preparedness and the response operations outlined in the ISC uh, public health and social measurement for COVID-19 guidance document for low capacity and the humanitarian second are applicable in Iraq. Actually, we most of those measurements were applied in Iraq, and uh, uh, we follow uh, the standards uh, measurements to, to keep the uh, the information updated and use it. And uh, with minor adjustment to try to um, make those measurements are uh, are uh, uh, applicable in Iraq. Uh, for example, we have performing tests of suspected cases of COVID-19 are restricted to directorate of health facility. We are as uh, NGOs, we are not doing uh, testing for the suspected cases. We are only identifying and diagnose and make assessment of severity of the cases to 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 know how to deal with the cases. For example, we can deal with the mild and moderate cases and the severe cases. We have to refer them to the specialized healthcare facilities and uh, we can do follow up uh, uh, as we are NGOs. All other preparedness and key actions can be applied uh, by the partners with the some con uh, contextualized and adaptations. Uh, I actually, uh, I want to add some things regarding the uh, those measurements. Uh, 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 from a while of time, we got uh, a field monitor from USA and they uh, identified all the systems. We got very good uh, marks regarding those uh, steps of uh, 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 of the service provision during COVID and the uh, uh, the steps of uh, infection prevention and control. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Hor Salman. Thank you so much for your intervention and. Uh, shedding light on uh, how um, yourself and Diary NGO is uh, responding in, in light of the COVID context in, in Iraq. You shared some really important highlights, um, including in terms of, again, highlighting challenges uh, with regards to access. And I understand you've heard you loud and clear that the access challenges 
uh, were uh, prior to COVID were a challenge, and with the mm -hmm. COVID-19 uh, pandemic, this has ex ex further exacerbated uh, the access challenges that are faced uh, in, in Iraq. And I also heard you loud and clear in terms of some of the challenges, of course, in delays of payment, of course, uh, you know, for um, uh, the Department of, of, of Health uh, um, workers, which is in itself also causing, uh, 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 presenting challenges in the ability to um, maintain the provision of critical basic services um, uh, um, uh, on the ground. Uh, you've also highlighted the importance of uh, coordination, information sharing, maintaining connections uh, across the board with local authorities, uh, national actors, international actors, because a key aspect in this response is to make sure triaging of information to be able to uh, trace um, and, and, and support and care uh, for the COVID-19 patients on the ground. So again, thank you for sharing a good example of how uh, this can be um, uh, achieved. And thank you also for um, highlighting the usefulness of the IC guidance. And, uh, uh, and we welcome, of course, please do Dr. Horror either um, by emailing us uh, directly or using the chat box to advise on specific areas in which the guidance can be further strengthened. Um, uh, because again, of course, the guidance is developed bearing uh, in mind that uh, it is a, 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 a guidance that, of course, needs to be adapted to local uh, context. But any uh, advice or ideas that you can share with us, uh, again, um, uh, using the chat box or also by emailing the Secretariat, we'll be very, very happy to receive. So again, thank you, Dr. Hor, and I'm sure there'll be questions and comments uh, coming from colleagues. Uh, online. Um, thank you again, Dr. Hur. And Thanks, that, thank you. Um, uh, uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, perhaps turn to Mr. Zakayu Kalebu uh, with World Vision in Tanzania. Um, so, um, of course, refugee camps present serious challenges in applying COVID prevention and control measures, particularly as the camps are often crowded and the availability of uh, wash um, uh, services uh, tend to be limited. Uh, so it'd be great to hear from you, Zakayo, regarding your experience um, leading the implementation of physical distancing measures in the Kigomo refugee camp. Uh, specifically, it would be great if you could share with us good practices and lessons learned around the delivery and distribution of humanitarian assistance and maintaining humanitarian service during the COVID response. So with that, over to you, Zakayo, please. Uh, I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. Yeah, as I've been introduced, I'm Zakayo, working with the World Vision and the program team leader for the refugee program in Kigoma. Yeah, I will be sharing with you the approaches of which World Vision employed in promoting or enhancing physical distancing during food distribution in refugee camp. Yeah, as we all know, in refugee camp, really there are some challenges associated with the overcrowding. Yeah, when vision implements the general food distribution and the nutrition program to refugees from Democratic Republic of Congo and Burundi, who are totaling to around the one to 3,000, and they are hosted in three refugee camps of Nyarugusu, Yarugusu for Congolese and some Burundian, and other camps, namely Mutendel and Duta. Yeah, for sure, overcrowding is pronounced and inadequate dwelling or shelter the norm in the refugee camps. As you can see on the photo here, you can see the crowd of people who are just there during the food distribution. But this photo was taken prior to COVID 19. <laughs> so, prior to COVID 19 pandemic, we have got two distribution centers, and each distribution site serves around 2,000 households per day, which makes it about 4,000 4, individuals who are coming to each center to collect some food. You can imagine the, the density or the, the overcrowding of people during the food distribution. Yeah, proceed. You can go, move to the next slide. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so we had several objectives to enhance that we did achieve the physical distancing. So in order to address the increased risk 
presented by COVID-19 pandemic, or division and the other partners that include UNESCO, EWP, government of Tanzania, we had to establish clear objectives that aimed at increasing protection to refugees and also services providers while ensuring that food services has continuity in the perspective. So the objectives include, one, to reduce the number of refugees arriving at the food distribution point at the same time. Initially, you know, we had no control. We had no limits to how many people should come at one distribution site. So we had to have this particular objective. Second was to reduce time spent by individual beneficiary at the food distribution point to make sure that at least a beneficiary has got a reasonable amount of time spent at the distribution time. Another one was, was to institute and manage a supportive and a suitable process that allows refugee to receive their entitlement with the effective crowd control that is sure at physical distancing. We want to improve the infrastructure at the food distribution site so that at least we have effective crowd control. Yeah, now to attain these objectives, we had several approaches. Yeah, the approaches of which we had to put in place include, we had to increase the number of food distribution days. Initially, we used to distribute food for five days. So we had to extend the number of distribution, distribution days from five to 10 days per month for one community. So since maybe for Nyarugusu we have got two communities, so it had to last for 20 days instead of 10 days. Another approach was to increase the number, the amount of food ration you received during one distribution cycle from 28 to 42 days. Initially we used to, 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 to distribute ration for that covers 28 days, but we had to adjust it to extend it to 42 days to give up a time at the site. Another one was to divide the beneficiaries for any given day into two sessions. Initially, they used to come at all together at one time, but we had now to divide the beneficiaries in two sessions meaning that session one could come at a, from eight to 11, then the second slot could come in at 11.30 to 14.30. All these aimed to reduce the number of beneficiaries coming at it, the distribution site at the time. Another approach of which we, which we used, we had to employ the use of PA, public system for, inf for information dissemination to make sure that these people can get information on the entitlement, on the safety measures far away. <clears throat> yeah, another one was to introduce the clear defined markings. As you can see on the, the, the photo here, we had to demarcate where a person should sit, taking into consideration the, the physical distancing, because this really enhanced the, the compliance from the beneficial, because they could easily see the marks. Also, we had to introduce the pre-package packaging of the food commodities, meaning that prior to the food distribution, we had to pre-package the, the food according to the family size. For example, family size one had to, 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 to pre-package the food equivalent to its family, family size two and up to 10 and 11. And also, we had also to construct a fence to enhance crowd management at the, or in the flow chart. Yeah, there were some of the, the distribution centers that had no fence. It was really a challenge, so we had to construct the fence in order to separate the eligible people coming to the food, food distribution, and those who are not eligible should be out or should be away, and also to enhance the, the, flow, the flow chart. Yeah, so achievements of which we observed during the, the, this particular process. There are several achievements of which we need observed, but I would like to share with you at least a few of the two of them. One that despite the contextual challenges, refugees have really accepted and cooperated with the physical distance while at food distribution points compared to other places. In fact, it was to our really, we are really very much happy to see that the refugees, they were quite complying with the, the introduced safety measures 
it is quite happy to really observe the gadgets which we are introduced at the site. Another one is reduced number of refugees at time at each distribution point led to an overall reduction in the crowd density at the food distribution point, as well as chaos among beneficiaries. In fact, it has really contributed to peace among the beneficiaries. Also, the beneficiaries they are quite impressed, they are quite happy. Even some of them are just commenting the system to be maintained even beyond COVID-19. Conclusion. Yeah, innovation that were introduced during the COVID-19 pandemic in refugee camps in Tanzania for sure represents overall improvements regarding both physical and environmental factors. And also strengthen our ability to ensure the dignity and safety of refugees while receiving their food. Yeah, another aspect that is some of these interventions, for sure they have been recommended by the beneficiaries in even in other stakeholders. And as we are talking now, in the refugee camps, we are having what we call joint assessment mission. This is a mission that comprises of all actors, partners working with the refugee program, including donors. We are interviewing the beneficiaries, we are assessing the, the quality of services in the refugee camps and what could be improved. The response of which we are getting from the refugee, they are quite impressed by the, the system that you have been introduced because of the COVID. And they are really committing this system to, to be maintained even beyond COVID-19, particularly during the food distribution whereby we are having the physical distance, which is, it gives the peace among the beneficiaries. And also nowadays beneficiaries, when, when they come to the distribution site, they are clothing that they spend little time compared to those days be prior to COVID-19, and also having the pre-packaged food commodities being displayed to them, they are quite impressed with that. So thank you very much for listening. That's what I had to share with you. Thank you for listening. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Zakayu, and uh, thank you also in particular but for um, uh, emphasizing, a of course, uh, a couple of many, many important points, but I appreciate the fact that you've also highlighted um, the importance of also engaging, of course, with affected communities, hearing their views in terms of what works well, what doesn't work well. And it's really, really uh, um, um, uh, promising and encouraging to hear the positive feedback that has been received in, turn, in terms of the innovative ways in which, of course, yourself um, um, and, um, and other critical organizations on the ground have adapted to the COVID by making sure that we, again, we minimize the risk to uh, refugees um, uh, in, in Tanzania, um, um, and that there is actually um, a call to ensure that uh, beyond COVID, uh, this is the uh, environment uh, you know, to ensure that we maintain and preserve the dignity and the safety uh, of affected communities and refugees um, during food uh, distribution. You've shared some really, really great and practical examples, Zakaya. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and again, I'm sure there'll be um, some additional comments and questions from uh, the participants as we, as we move forward. So uh, perhaps uh, with that, I'd like to uh, move uh, um, and turn now to Ms. Ndaye, who's the uh, resident humanitarian coordinator AI in Niger. Again, thank you um, um, for joining us. Uh, now, building on the points raised by Dr. Hur as well as um, uh, Zakayo, uh, and noting the complex crisis in Niger involving displacement, food insecurity, and limited uh, um, health infrastructure, uh, it was great, great, Khardiata, to um, hear from you um, with regards to an overview of the public health and social measures taken by humanitarians to minimize the impact of COVID-19 in Niger. Uh, we've also seen challenges around inclusion of IDPs and migrants in the COVID-19 response in several countries. Uh, and as such, it will be great, Khadiata, to hear from you uh, with regards to the approaches that are being taken to, ins to ensure that the needs of populations on the move were included and prioritized in humanitarian and national response plans. So uh, with that, over to you, please, uh, Khadiata. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Santana and colleagues. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. I'd be very uh, pleased to uh, participate in this uh, webinar and uh, share our experience, but also learn from uh, the good experience uh, 
uh, we have um, uh, 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 in this meeting. So my presentation will be in three points. I, yes, I will give a brief overview on the context because the Niger context has to be um, uh, reminded. Uh, uh, second, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I will talk about inclusion of IDPs in the response. And uh, I will finish with uh, some good practices or experiences we can share. So, uh, on the overview, uh, as you all know, before uh, COVID-19, Niger was uh, uh, really responded to the definition of a, a humanitarian and low capacity country because Niger is confronted with a multitude of challenges impacting vulnerable population. What, who are the majority of the population and who was already hit by uh, climate change uh, impact, insecurity, especially at the borders of uh, Mali, Niger, uh, Bur Burkina Faso, Chad, Ni Nigeria, and Libya. Uh, malnutrition has been uh, um, for years a major issue, both for humanitarian and development actors, and the prevalence of uh, uh, epidemics. Uh, so, and of course, issues of access, uh, access challenges for the humanitarian uh, actors to really reach the vulnerable population, but also access challenges for the population to access uh, social services. Due to the magnitude of the country, we are talking about a country of more than 1,200,000 square kilometers with a lot, with a lack of uh, uh, transport facilities and all of that. And uh, before COVID-19, just to summarize the situation, uh, Niger was ranking last on the Human Development Index, which gives, gives um, an indication of uh, where we stand when it comes to uh, basic social services, education, and health. So COVID-19 came uh, on top of these challenges with the increased number of vulnerable population in severe food insecurity and uh, the impact of uh, restrictive measures imposed by COVID. So um, in April, August, uh, from April to, to August, 25% uh, of the population was recorded as directly impacted by the COVID. And uh, in terms of uh, malnutrition, malnourished uh, ch children from the age of six to, to uh, uh, six months to uh, 59 months, we had uh, roughly 900,000 uh, children were in, in uh, need for treatment. So this is the situation we were facing uh, before COVID and with the COVID. And this situation is not expected to improve uh, because uh, according to the HRP for uh, the year 2021, there will be uh, close to 4 million people will be in need of assistance with significant needs in nutrition, Food security, health, including also mental health and well-being of the population. So this is uh, really to give you an uh, an uh, an overview of the situation. It is important to note that um, the remoteness of most of health facilities, as well as cultural norms, have a real impact on access to health system and makes it very difficult for population to access healthcare services and receive treatment. 
For example, just to give you an idea, in the region of, uh, of Telabeli, close to the uh, Burkina Faso and, uh, and, uh, and Mali border, due to the impact of attacks from violent extremists and non-state armed groups, more than 30 health centers are closed, meaning that uh, uh, 250,000 people are deprived of access to basic health services, most of them being women and children. And uh, uh, we can see that uh, in these regions, 80% uh, of the health services that uh, remain are provided by humanitarian actors. So this is really uh, the situation where we are. So the COVID-19 uh, was reported uh, in Niger in March, uh, in 19 March, and the pandemic has spread mainly in the urban areas and uh, especially the capital, uh, Niamey, with the total as of today of uh, 2,226 uh, uh, cases which is relatively low, but um, uh, uh, the social impact on, of the COVID is far more severe than the health Im impact uh, in, in the country. And as of today, uh, according to official uh, um, statistics, 38,000, more than 38,000 people has been tested. So the humanitarian community uh, um, organized uh, himself to support the government and the population on three uh, fronts. First, support to prepare and respond. And the humanitarian community was uh, very, uh, uh, in the very early response, supporting the drafting and the implementation of the national response plan, participating in the various technical communities, uh, participating in the high level uh, committee headed by the prime minister and really bringing the additional capacity the country needed really to draft a, a response that uh, a, a national response that uh, really takes into consideration the, uh, the, the international uh, standards when it comes to, to uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, response. The second line of support was in terms of uh, capacity. Yeah? Uh, capacity, technical cap capacity, logistical capacity, and also um, uh, financial capacity or also uh, the humanitarian uh, community reacted very rapidly to increase to support the increase in hospital uh, reception intensive care capacities ppes medicine and equipment provision additional staff for case management including and this is important non-covid diseases because uh, uh, in the same time, the country also was facing uh, the, let's say, traditional uh, uh, diseases, uh, malaria and, and uh, so on. So the capacity, the additional capacity uh, brought uh, in the response by the humanitarian community was uh, critical in terms of strengthening the preventive measures uh, strengthening also the communication, the risk communication uh, activities on, on uh, COVID-19, but also, and it is very important, integrating uh, COVID, COVID prevention uh, measures, messages, etc., into uh, uh, humanitarian aid operation. For example, in, including it into the food distribution, et cetera, et cetera. And this was uh, mainstreamed into all, all humanitarian activities. 
And a good example of this is that with the support of the UNHCR, UNFPA, uh, UNDP, uh, and other agencies uh, joining hands to the national authorities, the humanitarian community was um, uh, rapidly able to set up uh, a screening center in the national um, uh, in the national stadium, which was very helpful in terms of receiving uh, the population who was were just facing some symptoms, and uh, this was critical to just uh, help people in the hospitals to focus on the person or the or, uh, the people that needed a uh, cure. So this was. This is uh, these are examples of uh, supports that have been uh, provided by the humanitarian community, but also joining also with the other development partners. Now, when I move to the inclusion of IDPs and migrants in the COVID-19 response, uh, what is the approach? we did take here to ensure that the needs of the population on the move are included in the humanitarian and national uh, response. Here, I must say that uh, despite its own challenges, Niger has a very uh, positive uh, policy in terms of uh, refugees and migrants. As of today, there has there are um, uh, 229,000 refugees uh, in addition to 266,000 IDPs and several thousand of re returnees and migrants uh, living in Niger. And uh, the needs of the population on the move, IDPs, refugees, returnees, migrants, adds to the pressure on a system that is already weak and shaken by the COVID-19 um, uh, shock. So the approach here was uh, also threefold. One was to adopt an inclusive approach, considering that Affected population can be everyone. Local population, health personnel, uh, humanitarian organization personnel, their dependents, IDPs, refugees, returnees, host communities, migrants, and all other vulnerable population, including pregnant women, children, old people, people living in affected areas, Etc. Etc. This was critical at the beginning to set up and eh, this principle of inclusive approach in the response, and this was really built in the dialogue with the government and the dialogue with uh, within the humanitarian community and with the health workers. The second. Um, yeah, element of uh, 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 the inclusion was really to um, uh, to ensure that the needs of the IDPs, refugees, migrants are included into the humanitarian and, and national response plan. This was ensured and uh, clearly stated in the document with funding also targeting these groups. The third element, very important also in my view, was to ensure that migrants, refugees were not only recipients, but were also actors in the implementation of the response. And here we have a very good example with uh, uh, the involvement of the refugees in the production of soap and sanita uh, sanitation products that was 
really uh, uh, um, uh, produ uh, produced in uh, 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 considerable quantities, and this would brought at at something uh, that uh, 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 gives an indication that refugees are not only recipients of aid, but are able to contribute and play a role in, uh, in, the, in the response. So, so this is really a very good example of, uh, uh, of what has been done. And also in the production of masks, also refugees and migrants also were able to contribute uh, to the uh, to the uh, uh, response, not only for themselves but for the country uh, uh, at large. So these are uh, really key aspects that, uh, from the political, strategic to the operational uh, level, ensured that the population, the people in uh, in move are visible in the response and benef uh, benefits and participate uh, to the to the response now maybe um, some good practices one of them is the platform uh, we have helped set up um, at the highest level with the um, uh, uh, what we call the high level uh, consultative group, which is headed uh, on the government side by the prime minister and on the uh, international community side by the RC, myself, and the head uh, of the European Union uh, uh, delegation in the country. And this platform gathers uh, monthly uh, uh, all the representatives of the international community, ambassadors, and also uh, financial and uh, and uh, technical partners, monthly meeting where we review uh, the implementation of the response plan in in very con concrete terms, including reviewing uh, the financial commitment what has been done, or what needs to be uh, done further, and it allows us to monitor the implementation of the, of, of the response. So this is really something uh, we are very um, happy with because uh, it gives us an opportunity really to uh, have the decision makers at the different level really get the right in information and take the right decision uh, when it comes to the implementation of the of the response. Another uh, good example uh, is, is that the UN, with the support of OCHA, we developed uh, an SOP and uh, several SOP for clusters, providing a new operational guidance for humanitarian actors. And these SOPs focused on the prioritized key life-saving activities to be undertaken in line with the overall measures put in place to contain the spread of the pandemic. The summary of the SOPs and advocacy messages was submitted to the Prime Minister for him to give uh, appropriate instructions to the concerned authorities to facilitate delivery of humanitarian assistance. Um, our humanitarian air service, UNHAS, uh, was uh, suspended uh, over time, but due to this uh, communication and, uh, and uh, good uh, 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 relation we have built with the national authorities, this suspension was lift and uh, has been lifted and uh, this uh, was of great support for the deployment 
of the NGOs and humanitarian actors. I want to highlight uh, some uh, challenges that uh, remain uh, still, still many. Access is one of them. Uh, and uh, with the COVID, uh, what we have seen also is the weak adherence of the population to measures as like social distancing, et, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So this remains a challenge. Hopefully, uh, the intensity of the COVID-19 is decreasing, but uh, we need to continue the advocacy and the implementation of the preventive uh, measures and also maintain a sufficient capacity uh, in the humanitarian community to respond should we have uh, uh, a second uh, wave of the pandemic. Uh, the, another challenge is the difficulty of maintaining uh, economic restrictive uh, measures. Since the country is poor, the informal sector is is a, is a dominant and many people depend on, on um, uh, the small business, small activities. So it was very difficult for the government to maintain uh, these restrictive measures. So how, how to continue to uh, really uh, maintain a good capacity while uh, easing these measures is a challenge also the country is facing. And uh, we uh, we are also looking at ways that, uh, ways and means on our side to, to really ensure uh, with the people that economic activities are not blocked, but in the same time, people have access to the facilities they need to protect themselves. So I will stop there and uh, I stand ready for the questions and answers. Over to you. Brilliant. Many thanks again, Ms. Nidaye. Uh, thank you so much for really sharing a very, very dif different and important perspective. Um, of course, given your role as uh, the lead on the ground in, um, um, uh, uh, in the response Again, what is the strategic, political, and operational uh, challenges and steps being taken to address um, and respond to this uh, crisis? You've highlighted, again, one key point, of course, that came out very clearly is that the social impact um, is uh, far more severe uh, than the health uh, impact of COVID, uh, um, uh, which is very sobering. And, uh, and we've heard it also in previous you know, webinars that the secondary impact of the COVID pandemic uh, is indeed um, uh, a serious uh, challenge and concern uh, that we need to uh, come together and, 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 and address as a matter of priority. Uh, but I've also highlighted some really, really good and important uh, examples in terms of how um, the humanitarian community had, has geared to support the government uh, in responding to the crisis, including by helping in drafting and contributing to the national response plan, the technical, logistical, and financial financial capacity that's been provided. And thank you also for highlighting the importance of also in terms of the technical capacity from the health side, not only to support uh, the response to COVID, but also to ensure that critical health care um, is provided, including for malaria and other um, uh, um, uh, health uh, uh, risks uh, on the ground. And thank you also for sharing the good examples around the inclusive approach that was applied. Um, first is, again, everyone is equal when it comes to um, um, uh, being at risk of COVID. Uh, so again, that mindset shift, uh, as you, that you highlighted, Khabdiata, was critical um, uh, uh, in the response. Um, and I really, really appreciate the point that you've raised, Khabdiata, with regards to, again, working with migrants and refugees, not only as recipients of assistance, but again, the critical role that they have played um, in uh, supporting the response, including by with the distribution of soaps and other um, uh, um, uh, wash uh, products to uh, mitigate the impact of, uh, of the COVID response. So um, of the COVID pandemic. Uh, thank you again so much, Khadiyata. I can see already there's quite a few comments and questions from the participants. But I'd like to turn to Renee. Um, again, thank you so much, Renee, for, for your patience. 
very happy that you're able to join us uh, today. Uh, so Renee, in your role as Emergency Director Group member, uh, as well as uh, the critical and leading role that you are playing in WHO uh, with regards to the response to the pandemic, uh, can you please uh, advise us from where you sit at the global level um, on the public health me measures that have been effective to date? And of course, we've heard from colleagues uh, on the ground with regards, with regards to very context specific issues, but any additional uh, um, uh, information um, uh, that you can share with us, Renee, with regards to what worked well, what didn't work so well, that can inform uh, the uh, ongoing response would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Uh, so over to you, Renee, please, uh, with your your comments, last comments from the panelists. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Marva. And I'll be brief uh, because I think there are important questions in uh, in the in the chat box. Um, and delighted to be here. This is the right timing. It's the guidance came out in May. We really need to take stock and exactly as you said, hear from the country colleagues what worked, what didn't work, and what do we need to change. Um, just a, a few things. First of all, I want to thank the team that pulled these guidance together, including my colleague Teresa Zakaria, who's sitting next to me. Uh, they worked tirelessly, very quickly to get the guidance out. We've heard it might not have been perfect, but we really felt at that point that time was of the essence. We really wanted to make sure that our frontline responders had access to the evidence that was coming out and that we thought through how that might be different in low resource settings. I also want to applaud uh, you, Merva, and the whole IESC. I think the fact that we had broad stakeholder discussions uh, really made sure that the guidelines, the guidance was thought through, and it also reached our frontline responders very, 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 uh, very rapidly. Um, but I think for the most biggest thanks really goes out to the colleagues uh, in the field, uh, those of you that are working in some of the most challenging environments on the planet. Uh, you collectively showed positive, as Cardiata said. Uh, you showed that as a community we are resilient, we are innovators, we are adaptive. But most and foremost, you managed to rapidly scale up COVID prevention and control measures. Uh, and that really prevented further suffering, uh, suffering and deaths. Um, and despite all the hard work in these extremely challenging conditions, you find time to reflect and share lessons, uh, lessons that really have been beneficial for the entire world, including high-income countries. <laughs> um, and there is so much wealth, depth, and breadth in these lessons that we just can't capture uh, today. I think today is just a snapshot of what learning has happened. So I think what I really want to hear from the colleagues participating today as well, how can we continue capturing the learning that is happening? Um, at least from us, we are very committed uh, as WHO, but also as members of the IESC, uh, as the Global Health Cluster Lead Agency, uh, as those involved in the Global Health Cluster Task Force on COVID to really continue these discussions. This is just the beginning of what I hope are many more con discussions to, to further, uh, because these learnings will need to continue to change the operations and improve our operations. Essential health services, we've all talked about it, we've heard it, and uh, we've seen the impact on all the other health services, from preventive, such as vaccination, to curative, to palliative. Uh, these needs have even increased. We've seen the impact on sexual reproductive health service, some countries really having increased mental health and psychosocial support. So we really need to keep capturing the learnings in the countries uh, we are working in. But we also need to get ready for the next phase of the pandemic. Uh, new tools will come online. I think people have heard a lot about vaccines, uh, but there will all be also be new testing, new diagnostic, new therapeutics uh, that are coming online. So we just really need to make sure that these new evidence and tools, they also reach the people that we are most concerned about, the vulnerable populations that we collectively represent, and that we need to make sure that they continue to have access to these innovations, learnings, 
um, and, and evidence. So, um, Marwat, again, just to say that we are here to help capture the learning, adjust the learning. Uh, as you know, in WHO, I think uh, there is guidance coming out probably <laughs> way too much guidance. We try to make sense of that guidance and really help translate that into uh, operational implementation in the countries, and we really committed to continue uh, doing that. So I'm really looking forward. I've been trying. I need my glasses to try to capture some of the questions that are coming through on the chat, but really here to, to listen more to people that are representing our frontline responders. Thanks, Marvat. Brilliant. Many thanks, uh, many thanks, Renee, and thank you for, for being brief and, and, and to the point. And I echo uh, the great and extremely um, uh, important points that you've raised, really to thank colleagues on the ground for the amazing work that, you, you, that they, they are doing. And as you pointed out, this crisis uh, really demonstrated the um, resilience of, of, of the community, uh, the innovation um, um, and the persistence really to, despite all of the challenges, that the priority is to continue to stay and deliver and support uh, vulnerable communities on the ground. So I want to, to echo that point. And thank you, Renee, for the call for WHO and IC members are open to receive guidance, advice on how we can strengthen the tools. And thanks for highlighting the fact that, again, in preparation for the second, I guess, if I can call it so, the second phase of the, 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 the crisis, that there are indeed tools that we need to uh, keep an eye on. And we rely on your leadership, Renee, and WHO's leadership to make sure that, again, um, 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 what is required to support uh, field and field operations and vulnerable communities is made available um, uh, um, on, on a timely uh, basis. So um, uh, thank you again, Renee, and thanks so much to all of our panelists. And uh, perhaps I can kickstart. Um, there are a number of questions and comments that have come in in the chat box. Um, and maybe I can direct uh, perhaps the first uh, uh, question. It's a, um, I can imagine it's a tough one um, to respond to because it's a, it's a question with regards to data, um, uh, with regards to refugees uh, that have been infected and um, uh, you know um, that uh, have uh, been deceased in camps uh, as of today by COVID pandemic. Um, again, I personally do not um, uh, have uh, a, a, a picture of that. And maybe, maybe perhaps if it's okay, I'll ask uh, Zakayo um, perhaps to come in maybe with any thoughts in response to this question. And then I'll come to Renee as well in case there's any global uh, picture or, or overview that you can share with uh, participants. I'll start with this question to Zakayo, and then the second one I'll direct it to uh, Hur, uh, Dr. Hur, with regard to the services in the camps and what are the requirements set up by authorities? Uh, example, with, for example, um, are there COVID-free certificates for staff? And I suspect that. The um, uh, purpose of this question is to, uh, of course, ensure that uh, in addition, of course, to protecting uh, vulnerable communities, we need to make sure, of course, that staff that are delivering assistance uh, are safe and there are no risks associated with, um, you know, uh, increased infection um, um, uh, if, uh, if, if staff that are providing uh, this assistance are, are themselves falling sick. So maybe uh, we'll ask Dr. Hur to come in uh, afterwards with uh, a response uh, to this question. So uh, maybe over to you first, uh, Zakayo, and uh, and followed by Renee uh, in re to respond to the first question, and then we'll move on to Hur afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity and also for the question that have been asked. Yeah, for the refugee operation in Tanzania, with regard to the data, so far currently, because we are not uh, having the mass screening, and uh, there is no data of, uh, I mean, individuals who tested positive, and also we have never seen or heard or, of any person died because of COVID. So, and in fact, when we talk to the refugees, sometimes they, they do joke that, you know, they, have been, they cannot be punished twice by God that maybe that's why they are safe. So far, there is not any death that has happened because of COVID in the refugee operation in Tanzania. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Zakayo. And um, uh, again, promising to, to know that this is indeed the, the case 
um, uh, um, uh, on your end? And, and maybe again, I, apologies, Renee, I know it's a hard question, but I don't know if you have any information perhaps that you can share with the participants. Over to you. Sure, thanks. Um, Marvat, uh, we are indeed following closely what's happening in the different settings. It is difficult to compare because different countries, different settings have different testing capacities, also different testing strategies. Um, and we have indeed in some countries where we were expecting a, a big increase in cases and especially mortality, we haven't seen that happening. Uh, and some things can be explained by different demographies. We have seen that still the highest popu the population at highest risk remain older people with underlying uh, comorbidities that we might not necessarily see in refugee camps for populations are younger. But one thing I should have mentioned is we are also doing seroprevalence study, which is really trying to capture who has been exposed. Uh, for the moment, we don't see evidence that there would be more exposure in refugee camps. There is interesting evidence coming out through that in slums that might be the case. So this is something where we have a nice collaboration with different academic institutions, both from the north and the south, to really keep an eye on what the evolution, uh, what the evolution is, because this will also be important as vaccines come online, because we won't have hundreds of millions of vaccines uh, coming out in one day. We need to be very clear on who are the populations and individuals at the highest risk that we can prioritize for access to vaccines. I think the point on, on, on duty of care is a, is a very, very important one, and we cannot underscore that um, enough. Uh, and that's also part of the discussions we are currently having uh, within the IESC on when new tools come in line, how do we prioritize that we ourselves, our frontline health workers, uh, get access to those first. Um, so the seroprevalence, I can, you see they're doing me a little eye test, I can see where the seroprevalence studies are planned. Mm -hmm. They are happening a little bit all over. Uh, it's all really nice from Haiti to, uh, to Bangladesh, uh, but I can share details uh, on where these studies are taking place and also share the details on the collaborative centers and partners we are working with that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Renee. And and we'll just move uh, swiftly to uh, Dr. Hurra, please, uh, with the second question, please. Go ahead. Yeah, hello. <clears throat> Actually, a uh, directorate of health, and uh, as we are NGOs, we are not asking the uh, staff who is working uh, in the camp to provide. Uh, COVID-19 uh, free uh, certificate because actually they are already uh, like health staff and they are doing in their <laughs> governmental facilities. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. It's okay. And uh, they already working in health facilities, governmental health facilities. So they are doing COVID-19 routinely, especially who is working in COVID-19 uh, like isolation uh, units. So uh, uh, in that case, even I asked him to provide me um, a COVID-19 uh, free certificate, maybe after one week he will get infection. So what we, will, we, what we are doing, we are, uh, we are uh, like coordinate with the directorates of health in, in all governorates to tell us that which uh, their staff has infected or suspected. So uh, we get these uh, results and then we take an action uh, for either uh, that staff to stop work and of course he will not come to the camp or not come to the health facilities. Uh, in, in that case, we are ensuring those staff, uh, even who, who, is not, uh, who is not doing COVID-19 uh, test, uh, any staff who have any symptoms or uh, or, or uh, exposed to a positive case uh, or in contact with the positive cases, already he will isolate. We, we ask him to isolate himself and to stay away from this health facility to prevent the spread of infection and to, uh, not, uh, uh, to, not, uh, to expose to those beneficiaries, especially in the vulnerable uh, 
population in the camps or in informal settlement. Second thing, um, Dr. Kamal already uh, shared in the chat box uh, the uh, COVID-19 um, uh, dashboard uh, uh, and infograph. Uh, which is uh, contain all uh, the information regarding the uh, confirmed cases, uh, cured cases, active death, and total samples tested per day, uh, and the uh, and the daily samples. So you can uh, or everybody can uh, check uh, the uh, all the information regarding uh, COVID-19 uh, dynamic infograph dashboard in Iraq. Uh, in that links, uh, who shared uh, Dr. Kamal. Thank you. I hope I answered your question regard this point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Hur. Um, uh, indeed, uh, you have, and thank you for, for the elaboration. Um, uh, maybe, maybe we'll move uh, to uh, the next question, which is around addressing um, uh, the access issues uh, um, that are confronted on the ground. And I know uh, Dr. Hur, uh, you've mentioned some of the access issues uh, faced in Iraq, uh, but also um, Khardiata, you mentioned uh, some of these uh, challenges as well in, in Niger. So perhaps I'll, I'll direct this question to you, Khardiata, in terms of what systems uh, are in place or what coordination system approaches are in place in terms of liaising and engaging with authorities to address uh, some of these uh, barriers for humanitarian action, access. So over to you, Khardiyata, please, uh, with this question. And then following that, uh, we will um, turn to uh, perhaps Dr. Hur and Rene uh, again with regards to um, a question that came in uh, around uh, concerns with service delivery disruption. So basic um, uh, services, basic health services, and concerns or fears of patients to come to the clinic, uh, in addition to also other some of the other barriers or challenges um, uh, that are making it difficult for patients to go to the clinics, including movement restrictions um, and, and, and capacity uh, and resource constraints. Um, is there a risk that we would be seeing higher uh, mortality uh, rates um, linked to non-COVID uh, uh, concerns or uh, um, health complications uh, as a result of these barriers? Um, uh, or not. So uh, again, it's a, it's a broader question, perhaps, uh, you know, specifically to for Dr. Hur and the concept of Iraq, but also more globally, Rene, if you can share your thoughts on that. So uh, back to, to you, please, uh, Khardiyata, on the uh, access uh, issue. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, access is an issue. Uh, humanitarian access to in need and vulnerable population access to basic services. And um, uh, due to the security situation uh, in the border, uh, border with Mali, Burkina Faso, Chad, Nigeria, and, uh, and also specific uh, issues with the border, uh, the border of uh, Libya. Um, there is an issue, an access issue uh, with regard to the military operation ongoing, uh, reacting against the attack. So, um, furthermore, uh, you may recall that there was there was an, a major incident uh, with the in August with the tragic death of six humanitarian workers uh, uh, 60 kilometers far from uh, Niamey. And uh, this situation has, uh, 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 as a consequence, the decision for, from the government side to impose escort to all uh, uh, humanitarian and development actors movement. Of course, NGOs are able to operate, but uh, UN agencies and other development partners uh, have seen the movement limited uh, by this uh, measure. So, in one hand, uh, there is an obligation for the country who is responsible for the security to take measures, but in the other hand, based 
on the humanitarian principle, access has to be granted to humanitarian actors. So this brought up, uh, this situation brought us to a discussion with the government on how to really lift uh, the general uh, imposition of export as a condition to access to some places in the country. And second, how to agree on roads where escort is needed because it is the last resort uh, 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 solution to ask to access a vulnerable population. So it means only that access is an issue in a very volatile security uh, situation, we have to secure humanitarian actors. And also in the same time, we have to ensure that humanitarian intervention benefit to the population in, in need. So we have set up a very strong military coordination mechanism that allows the military um, uh, uh, authorities to be informed on time on the humanitarian movement so they can secure the deployment of the uh, humanitarian uh, actors, but without uh, um, uh, putting an unnecessary uh, additional pressure or additional exposure or risk on the humanitarian actors. So this is uh, something we have uh, put in place. The other thing we have in place is to design very clearly on a map and agree with the government on where really we can access uh, with the maximum of uh, of uh, mitigation capacity of the risk we are facing uh, um, uh, in, in the humanitarian deployment. So if we agree on where it is necessary to have uh, military escort and the duration of the military escort and how we operate together, it will uh, prevent for a general measure imposing military escort to any deployment of of the of the of the uh, uh, humanitarian operation because it is not only uh, an issue for the humanitarian principle but it overexposes humanitarian uh, actors to really um, uh, uh, risk to be targeted as uh, partners of the military forces or partners of the government. I don't know if I have answered your question, but uh, these are some, some uh, the mechanisms we have in place to, uh, to deal uh, with the access. Uh, maybe another thing is, is uh, really the use of our humanitarian air service that is really helpful in, uh, in, uh, in uh, scaling up the deployment cap capacity uh, of the humanitarian uh, actors in places where uh, it will be very difficult to go by, by road, not only difficult, but risky uh, to go uh, by, by road. Over to you. Thank you so much, Khadiata. Well copied and, and very uh, clear uh, response. And perhaps as uh, we we are close to the end of the uh, webinar, we have six minutes uh, to go and, and we uh, I'd really like us to push to conclude on time. Uh, maybe we'll just move uh, swiftly to uh, Dr. Hur. Uh, Rene, we, we have quite a few questions for you. So we'll, we'll ask Dr. Hur to respond to the question with regards to uh, the patients' uh, uh, access to clinics and fears of going to the clinics and uh, some of the risks associated 
with um, um, increased mortality rates for non-COVID uh, related reasons. So over to you, Dr. Hodder, please, uh, for some thoughts on this question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hello? Yes, hear you loud and clear. I can hear you very well, yes. Unfortunately, I didn't hear the question well. Actually, uh, it seems the internet connection not so well. Uh, actually, I didn't, cut, I didn't pick up your question regarding the... Uh, yes. Okay, let me let me repeat the the, the question. So uh, there are uh, concerns um, that the service delivery disruptions, especially in terms of healthcare, uh, and including in terms of patients fearing to go to the clinics, uh, as well as also concerns uh, because of the movement restrictions that patients can go to the clinics, that the there will be an increase in mortality rate of uh, individuals or vulnerable communities. Uh, that are not mm -hmm. related to COVID, so uh, mortality due to other uh, health-related uh, reasons. This is this is the question from one of the participants. Is there a risk that there will be an increase in mortality due to non-COVID-related illnesses? Um, uh, your thoughts? Uh, I, know, I know it's a hard question, but your thoughts on that would be appreciated. Okay, thank you. Thanks for raising this point. Actually, the access issue, uh, as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, before uh, some, min some minutes, uh, actually, uh, we are trying to reach, uh, trying to reach uh, those vulnerable communities uh, uh, either um, through mobile teams or mobile clinics, actually. And uh, uh, actually, uh, we are coordinating with the... Um, uh, referral uh, centers and uh, ambulance call centers to refer those case those cases who cannot reach the um, uh, health facilities especially uh, uh, in, in covid cases or in non covid cases also uh, and also um, those uh, those who have um, who have to need to refer those to the specialized care healthcare centers. We also coordinate with the um, uh, security checkpoints with the uh, security security uh, like authorities uh, uh, who have uh, uh, to facilitate the their transportation either by governmental uh, ambulances or by uh, uh, international or national agencies, uh, even by uh, private cars or private transportation uh, uh, to reach out them to the um, uh, health facilities as soon as possible. Uh, and uh, regarding the mortality r rate increase, because already people, uh, uh, as uh, as uh, far as they are fear from reaching the uh, health facilities, uh, they, we try to um, uh, ensure them that uh, there are separate isolation centers and uh, the COVID-19 wards. Uh, it is not in in the same hospitals, so it is uh, uh, it is just separated. You can go to a specialized center because most of people, especially in the vulnerable communities, they are fear to go. Even there is a, an access to reach it. So they, uh, as they hear from rumors, hear from another. Um, like um, people that uh, all the governmental facilities are infected are with COVID, even the staff are uh, all in contact with the uh, uh, COVID patients. Therefore, uh, they are uh, uh, mostly coming to uh, an uh, NGO's facilities or uh, a health uh, service provider. Uh, uh, because uh, we are strictly following uh, uh, all the recommendations on the IPC measurements, uh, and uh, actually uh, we didn't re we didn't uh, 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 like uh, uh, document we, we didn't documented any case in, in our health facilities that infected. Uh, therefore, uh, people interesting in us in our facilities and uh, through mobile clinics we reach the far uh, area or hard to access 
to uh, identify those cases who need uh, to uh, reach the health facilities. Uh, thank, you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Thank you so much. Thank you for the response. Uh, we're we're on the hour right now. So uh, with, if colleagues have a few more minutes, uh, I have two last questions that I'd like to direct, direct one to Zakayo and one to Renee. Uh, to Zakayo, uh, it's particularly on the issue of accountability to affected people and risk communication and community engagement. Uh, what do we know about communities um, um, with regards to perceptions of risk? Uh, and how can we use these perceptions to reduce risk and improve risk communication and community engagement? So, um, uh, again, um, any any information that you can provide in terms of how we can better uh, uh, communicate uh, uh, risks uh, to affected communities um, and uh, their perception of risks. What what are these perceptions of risk, and how can this inform uh, improved risk communication? Would be appreciated, Zakayo, from your experience in Tanzania. Uh, and then to Renee, and for the final question is, uh, there was an interesting comment that came in around uh, humanitarian frontline workers are at high risk of infection um, and may be considered um, uh, as priority, uh, as one of the priority groups for the, for the vaccination. Uh, so just maybe in just in general terms, Renee, any updates or any information that you can share with the participants with regards to ongoing work uh, advocacy uh, around the issue of vaccination and um, making available, once the vaccines are, are available, how indeed are we going to prioritize uh, these vaccines to vulnerable communities, including humanitarian workers on the ground, would be greatly appreciated. And we will conclude uh, with that question, colleagues, um, and apologies if we were not able to uh, respond to the many uh, important and rich questions that you have posed. So over to you first, Zakayo, on the risk communication and community engagement issue. And then over to Renee, please, on the vaccination question. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. To comment on this one, then I could start by saying that having clear and the practical standard operating procedure or guideline timely for responding to us whatever pandemic is quite crucial for effective response. In fact, having this particular one, it also enhances the effective engagement. You know, like in refugee camps, we have various stakeholders. We have the community themselves, we have other cooperating partners who are working together. So once we have the clear standard operating procedures of guidelines, you know, it's a tool during the engagement. Because, you know, we have where to refer and we have an item to table on the table during the, the engagement process. So for sure, this is quite crucial. And also having the the goodwill from various stakeholders. You know, this particular response, how this particular pandemic needs multi-stakeholders, you know, involvement or engagement. So having the goodwill from various stakeholders is also another, another aspect which has value in terms of effective, you know, response attributed or contributed by effective engagement. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, Zakayo, for, for the response. And then I'll move uh, you know, over to uh, yourself, Renee, with uh, the final response to the question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Marva. This is way too much to capture in, in, in an hour and a half. Just a few things to, to flag. First, um, unfortunately, service delivery and access is further um, complicated by attacks on health. We've seen attacks on COVID facilities. We've seen attacks on, on maternities. So I think this is something that we need to continue monitor and, and call out. On the very important uh, question of service delivery, yes, we know that service delivery has been interrupted, and that's not just happening in humanitarian settings, that's happening around the globe. Uh, and that ranges from immunization uh, sessions. Uh, you can see a joint statement we issued today with UNICEF on the impact this has on measles and, and polio. It has impact on family planning. I know Hania is online. We know this has impact on institutional delivery. It has impact on all other uh, all other diseases we're trying to combat. Um, we know from anecdotal evidence that there might be excess mortality, but that's something, the two things here that we need to do is really strengthen 
these excess mortality measurements that we have evidence that we can put forward and there we can have a dedicated session on that. But I think the most important is that we really collectively need to advocate for essential services to resume. Uh, the guidance that we were talking about really highlights how we can do this safely. And I think this is an advocacy and an operational agenda we just need to uh, rally around and just uh, together come together and say we need to start vaccinating children again. We need to make sure women that want family planning have access and those that live with HIV and TB have access to their treatment and all the other diseases that I'm, that I'm not mentioning. Um, um, Mervat, on the very important discussion on vaccination, um, we are organizing because this is evolving as we speak. We don't have a vaccine yet. We don't know which vaccine we will have. But we have various discussions, including led by the Global Health Cluster, and I know some of my cluster colleagues are online. So what I would like to suggest is that we can't, we can't address it now, that we do invite some of you through the cluster discussions, or otherwise we organize a dedicated discussion, because you are exactly the audience we want to discuss what are the priorities? What are some of the challenges that we will face as these new tools come online? So I really invite all of you to be part of that discussion uh, and look forward to a specific invitation to that. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Um, uh, and again, a huge, huge, huge thanks to all of our panelists. And uh, also thank you to the participants. Apologies that we went over time, but obviously, a critical topic, uh, a lot of interest and a lot of questions and very helpful comments that I could see in the chat uh, box. Uh, as you pointed out, Renee, this is one of many more discussions that we will have on this topic. Um, the guidance that was developed, developed uh, to respond in low capacity and humanitarian settings is one of the most critical guidance documents that has been produced. And as you mentioned, uh, Renee, um, uh, again, with thanks to the ISC uh, members, um, WHO, and many of the colleagues that were involved in its um, um, formulation, it was produced in, in May. We're open to receive any comments, feedback, advice on how we can improve it. And thanks for highlighting as well that there are additional tools, uh, Renee and colleagues, that will be made available uh, to make sure that we are uh, in a better position to respond uh, to the, this very uh, evolving uh, and dynamic um, uh, operating environment uh, that we are uh, living in at the moment. Uh, I think from all of the presentations, and really, really huge thanks to the panelists who are representing, uh, again, uh, the voices and the response on the ground. It's very, very clear that the response has to be very context-specific. Um, the innovation, the adaptability of uh, frontline responders, uh, governments, uh, NGOs, communities, uh, humanitarian workers, humanitarian leaders is, is really, really commendable. And, and, and again, I, 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 I join again Renee's earlier point that it's really appreciated and, 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 and extremely, extremely um, uh, important and valuable. Uh, I know that at the center of all of this is, again, um, is a commitment to make sure that we continue to deliver on humanitarian assistance and protection, life-saving humanitarian and protection uh, needs uh, on the ground uh, and adapting to uh, a very challenging environment. So thank you for your innovation. Thank you for your, your resilience. Thank you for your adaptability. And thank you for carving time to revert and advise us on what works, what doesn't work, and how can we do things better. Many, many opportunities to come, inshallah, to continue this uh, conversation. And I'll take you up, uh, Renee, on your offer on the discussion around the vaccine at the, at the right moment. Uh, a heads up that the next briefing, inshallah, we'll be having a briefing, a discussion on um, uh, uh, responding to protection concerns during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we're finalizing, um, um, you know, our um, uh, uh, list of panelists and speakers for this issue. So please do watch the space and do visit, visit the website where we ha you'll have more details on the timing and the, uh, um, and the panelists that will be speaking to this issue over the next couple of weeks, inshallah. Again, thank you so much to our brilliant uh, panelists and thank you so much to all of the colleagues online, including those who are on the ground. Thank you for making the time to listen and share your experiences. Have a great uh, day, evening uh, to all of you.